very good evening everyone i hope i am audible uh, i'd like to thank uh, dr prasad pandey dr gunjan and the entire team of uh, edu search for coming up with this webinar welcome all the participants uh, for today and uh, so far uh, we've all heard about uh, morbid obesity being a chronic inflammatory state which automatically tells us that uh, the tissue that you are handling is uh, inflamed tissue so we have to be very careful next we heard uh, from uh, dr barucha and uh, dr kandelwal on uh, the uh, importance of the surgical uh, technique the importance of uh, selection of procedures and the importance of standardization of a surgical procedure and uh, matching the matching your patient to the right procedure that you have in your armamentarium if you falter in any of these things at any single step or in at any single point is when you're going to land up uh, with a complication <clears throat> and uh, that is what exactly we are going to discuss uh, this evening uh, complications of uh, metabolic surgery which could be uh, varied it could come in uh, any form uh, they could be really severe at times but actually usually are very very infrequent especially uh, with uh, experienced uh, hands uh, with high volume centers and as you climb your learning curve uh, performing these procedures you will get better and better just like in any other specialty a surgical specialty we will have surgical or non surgical complications when we are practicing uh, metabolic surgery they could be intraoperative they could be post operative uh, they could be early complications or late complications but uh, it is always going to be uh, complicated when you are dealing with a morbidly obese person or a super obese person that is exactly what uh, the earlier speakers have already mentioned um, so we are going to talk about the early uh, complications which are in the form of nausea vomiting they could be leaks in the staple line or the anastomotic leak uh, that we have to deal with in even in other gi surgeries there could be intestinal obstruction um, there could be deep vein thrombosis pe and other uh, uh, other smaller uh, niggles that you could face in the early stage after the surgery there could be uh, late complication which are usually uh, nutritional you could have ulcerations dumping biliary reflux uh, gerd herniation internal hernias uh, weight regain much later on after performing the bariatric surgery maybe 8 10 months down the line maybe a year down the line or 3 years down the line because once you perform a bariatric procedure on a patient in anybody who is already practicing bariatric surgery uh, will agree with me that uh, a bariatric surgery patient is your patient for life uh, you are married to that patient for life and these people are going to come back to you uh, again and again with anything and everything even if it's not related to the particular procedure then uh, sudden weight loss also is uh, lipogenic so you can have uh, cholelithiasis um, delayed uh, complication fistula formation you could have a gastrogastric colonic uh, pleural any of these fistulas after a bariatric procedure all of them have been reported enough in uh, literature we'll start uh, one by one and uh, deal with uh, the most uh, commonest uh, complications uh, that we see in our day to day practice you see nausea vomiting this this will practically be in all the patients immediately post operative um due to the sudden reduction in the stomach capacity um that is why when uh, dr kandelwal was talking earlier she was, she mentioned in her talk that counseling is the most important part of uh, uh, performing a bariatric surgery when you uh, prepare your patient mentally that one of these things nausea and vomiting due to even having a tiny sip uh, of liquid more than required more than the capacity of the new stomach that you form whether it is a um, rygb stomach pouch or whether it is a sleeve stomach after a sleeve gastrectomy uh, needs to be inform to the patient very well so that they anticipate what's coming next and you will avoid having severe nausea or vomiting uh, post surgery you have to retrain them in their uh, dietary habits just like we raise a newborn child so it's just like that and hence uh, uh, counseling is very key uh, and again uh, use of uh, antiemetics may be required which uh, all of us know how to prescribe so basically if uh, it still persists then you are going to rule out uh, edema you are going to rule out uh, obstruction stenosis and uh, 
Dr. Khandelwal had uh, earlier mentioned about uh, knowing uh, at least a uh, couple of bariatric procedures and also knowing how to perform upper GI endoscopy. I firmly believe that upper GI endoscopy, you have to perform your own upper GI endoscopies as a bariatric surgeon. And when you do that, you will see all kinds of uh, things happening. You can see uh, narrowing of the lumen. You can probably see uh, stitch gone wrong, closing the lumen. All these things uh, you will notice only if you know how to do your own upper GI endoscopy. A CT gastrograph in swallow is always handy and uh, it can help us establish our diagnosis in the early post-op period if there is persistent vomiting in a patient, especially uh, if there is a a uh, sleeve uh, or a gastric bypass and uh, surgical treatment obviously may be required sometimes even um, thiamine deficiency could uh, cause uh, severe vomiting and this also again can be treated medically uh, leaks this is uh, the waterloo of a bariatric surgeon this uh, if uh, not uh, done properly, the procedure not done properly, as Dr. Barucha had mentioned in his uh, particular uh, talk earlier, is going to land you in trouble. Uh, most of the leaks in a sleeve gastrectomy are usually at the upper end of the sleeve close to the GE junction because of uh, improper uh, staple fire going to, too close to the GE junction. We could have anastomotic leaks uh, in a RYGB or in a one anastomosis uh, gastric bypass. Uh, it could again happen due to faulty technique or improper technique. You can always have uh, hydrogenic injury where an instrument can go and poke into a bowel which you have not recognized uh, during the surgery. So it's always very, very important to document your uh, uh, procedures in the form of videos so that you can always go back and look at the video completely whenever you're facing such a problem. So you can identify the problem and you can correct it immediately if your patient is clinically not settling. That is your first thing that you need to do. Go back to your video, look at it and see where the problem lies. And that will help you uh, grab it faster. That will help you correct it faster. And uh, <clears throat> you can also have uh, biliary peritonitis, especially in an OAGB. And that could be life-threatening. So we need to, uh, as Dr. Nidhi had earlier mentioned, select the right patient, uh, right procedure for the right patient. And this will go a long way, even in terms of managing complications. <clears throat> so these are all the sites uh, which, which are normally uh, going to be your problematic area. These are the you know, places where you're going to look for the problems and uh, try and treat them again. Uh, documenting your surgical videos and going back and looking at it is going to help you get them faster <clears throat> and obviously uh, from our general surgery training we know that these patients were typically present with features of perforative peritonitis the abdominal wall in a morbidly obese patient is really thick uh, the paniculus uh, can um, hide the findings of uh, a classical acute abdomen you know otherwise seen in our regular patients and uh, hence a uh, contrast study, a CT guided contrast study is always going to come handy. Obstruction, small bubble obstruction, especially especially in the RYGBs or in OAGB, more likely in an RYGB. And uh, you could have a kinked intestine loop. Uh, you could later on see a stenosis at the inshishura uh, or the anastomotic stenosis. Uh, if you don't close the hernial or defects, uh, you can have internal herniation. Again, these patients are going to present with acute abdomen. Your index of suspicion should be really high for uh, these kind of uh, problems that uh, can be encountered, especially after an RYGB. Patient can have uh, bilious vomiting. There may be distension, but again, because of the uh, large abdominal wall and the paniculus, a patient may, you may not be able to identify it as classically as you would in a normal weight person. Uh, again, a CT scan is uh, pretty telltale in any of these situations. You will always find a mesentric whirling, especially when you have uh, twists in the loop of bowel and you will find a cutoff uh, in the blood supply at the level of the mesentery. And that is something which is always going to pinpoint and tell you that uh, this is where your problem lies. <clears throat> Just trying to change my slide. Yeah. Okay. So uh, surgical management, I think uh, intestinal obstruction, uh, everybody knows the surgical management in an intestinal obstruction. You go in again, you laparoscope, you can, um, or in, in case of a sleeve, sometimes you get a king sleeve or a twisted sleeve. 
and uh, the blood supply may be compromised you can always convert it into a ryGB you can uh, even probably convert it into an oagB but you need to counsel the patient's relatives and the patient before uh, doing any of these things so you need to give them these options that okay I'm going in again and these are uh, the possibilities and if any of these possibilities uh, arise and I can see them I may be doing a B or C so you need to keep them aware keep them in the loop take consent for all these particular things. Internal herniation normally will not come as an early post-operative complication. It will be seen as a delayed post-operative complication. And uh, one needs to uh, uh, keep that in mind. Again, a CT scan is going to catch it and you, are, you can go in and uh, correct the problem. If you delay it and your index of suspicion is... Uh, not high then you will land up with the resection of bowel and sometimes that could be catastrophic because you bypass the long segment and you don't know which way the gangrene is going to progress depending on where the twist was and where the compromise of the small bowel loop is uh, deep vein thrombosis dvt uh, leading to a pe again is uh, one of the uh, 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 biggest uh, reasons for mortality post-operatively in uh, bariatric or metabolic surgery and uh, they all all our patient populations are at a very high risk of uh, dvt and which could lead into a p which could be life-threatening uh, so always uh, keep that in mind always uh, give uh, uh, flotron pumps uh, during the hospital stay uh, blood thinners as a part of dvt profile axis uh, in our protocol, in our practice, we give it for two weeks, low molecular weight heparin to avoid all these uh, problems. And patients, especially the elderly who have osteoarthritis and who are undergoing bariatric surgery, they are already struggling to walk, uh, are very high risk for DVT. You should keep that in mind and make sure that they get ad adequate physiotherapy and you counsel them well to be mobile and uh, uh, do their best as far as physical activity is concerned after going home. And uh, you need to screen all uh, the patients uh, irrespective of their age, depending on how big they are, uh, because they are at a potentially high risk to develop DVT. Uh, and uh, postoperatively, uh, like I already mentioned, all these steps which we need to take and most importantly, adequate hydration, because uh, patients usually uh, forget and not just forget because their stomach volume has reduced drastically, uh, they are not able to. But if you keep telling them that you need to have more water, you need to have more water and even skip a few uh, meals, it's better to have more water than have a meal. That's, that's, that's going to be a good part of counseling after a bariatric surgery. And that will also help uh, in the long run to prevent DVT. And uh, it can be a delayed uh, post-operative complication DVT. It can happen even a few months later. So always uh, keep that in mind and also tell the patient uh, uh, or make the patient and relatives aware of it. <clears throat> Malnutrition, this is a, a long-term complication. Uh, sometimes it can even uh, come in the near, sh near short term, like not immediately post-op, but in a couple of months after surgery, maybe three, four months after surgery, especially in uh, long segment bypasses. And uh, we could see protein deficiencies a majority of our patients in India are vegetarians. Uh, they could also be Jain, which is uh, a further level above uh, being vegetarians. We could have iron deficiency anemia, which is already prevalent because iron deficiency anemia is anyways uh, largely present in the Indian population. Then vitamin B12 folic acid deficiencies, which, could, which have been reported uh, even... Uh, many, many years after surgery, a vitamin D3, trace minerals. So we have to keep a watch for malnutrition. We have to keep a watch for um, uh, all these uh, elements and uh, see what kind of a diet the patient is taking, whether he's taking the nutritional supplements as, as advised on discharge or not. Um, patients, of, when, when you do a thorough preoperative evaluation, you will know uh, the preoperative uh, existing deficiencies which the patient already has and you have to stress more on correcting them and asking them to be sure that you know they are going to take these the compliance is very very important dr khandelwal had mentioned in her talk earlier that uh, counseling and repeatedly uh, pushing it in their head that uh, these are very important um, uh, factors modifying the lifestyle is a very important factor and it goes a long way in preventing these complications if their follow-up is poor, the compliance is poor, again, uh, you know, selecting a procedure 
uh, or selecting the right procedure for the right patient, one of the important factors which I think in the practice is that you also need to know the geographical location of the patient in in a in a country like india patients can come from different parts of the country we get patients from different part different countries as well of different parts of the world and uh, you need to try and understand that these patients are not going to come back to you regularly to follow up the, the way a patient is, who lives in your own city is going to come so selection of procedure here is very crucial because you want to do a procedure which is least malabsorptive, you want to do a procedure which is least GI complex uh, anatomically, so that even if they land up in trouble, somebody locally, a general surgeon locally, a laparoscopic GI surgeon locally can handle it and they uh, should not uh, be caught unawares as to what is really happening. So never do complex, uh, complex bariatric procedures for patients who are coming from far off, who are not from your city. Uh, it uh, helps in the long run with respect to even long-term complications like malnutrition. Uh, um, so basically, uh, malnutrition or, uh, you know, nutritional issues can be corrected uh, with the help of a good diet. So the primary uh, thing that we need to remember after performing or while performing a metabolic surgery is that we are not just trying to achieve weight loss. The final goal is to achieve health or good health. And hence, uh, emphasis on very good follow-up uh, with the surgeon and with the team of dietitians or the entire surgical team, which includes a nutritionist. And supplements have to be taken correctly. Supplements have to be taken regularly. And the emphasis on a high-protein, uh, low-calorie diet is a must. This is a busy slide and, uh, you know, all, all these are available in literature. I don't need to go into them. I'm sure you will find them uh, and enough uh, references on all types of uh, different types of vitamin deficiencies. We've all studied that in our basic sciences. <clears throat> so what are the solutions for medical and surgical corrections? Uh, investigate thoroughly if there is no improvement despite thorough medical management and there seems to be a surgical issue review the primary surgery determine especially in bypasses the bp limb or the pancreatic limb the bypass segment you can do say contrast studies you can do upper gi scopies to find out what what's gone wrong what's not gone wrong uh, sometimes we may have to reverse uh, or try to reverse the uh, procedure to normal anatomy. Sometimes we can get away just by shortening the biliopancreatic limb if it is excessively long. Patient uh, medically try to give the patient PPI, lifestyle modification. If he's a smoker, has to quit smoking and uh, surgical management. Sometimes we need to refashion the anastomosis laparoscopically, endoscopically, whichever you're proficient with. And probably even reverse the surgery at times if uh, the symptoms are very severe patient can sometimes comes with a come uh, come to you with hematemesis uh, from the ulcer sometimes they can land up with perforation so these these are times where you have to do something radical surgically to make sure that you've done the right thing and got the patient out of danger danger <clears throat> dumping syndrome as we all know any uh, any segment of the bowel which has been bypassed you can have a patient with early or late uh, dumping i won't go into the uh, details of that but basically to manage them uh, you need to have uh, the patient doing small frequent meals avoid liquid within 30 minutes of uh, a solid meal avoid simple sugars increase fiber and complex carbohydrate intake increase your protein intake in the diet and sometimes you can have uh, you know you can prescribe a carbos as a pharmac pharmacological agent uh, to slow down the process and uh, very rarely you may end up uh, looking at reversal as an option Biliary reflux is a problem which you can see uh, in OAGB, especially not in the other surgical procedures, uh, bariatric procedures. It's still very controversial. People are not able to, or surgeons are not able to uh, really uh, come to a conclusion about uh, whether biliary reflux is harmful or not harmful. And uh, it behaves like a bill rod to the loop GJ in an OAGB and can cause severe reflux. And you have patients complaining are coming back to you saying that you have bile we have bile in our mouth in the middle of the night uh, suddenly out of the blue and uh, these patients uh, come to us with marginal ulcers esophagitis and you know these can be uh, progressive and go and go on to form uh, barrett's esophagus which is uh, obviously as we all know uh, uh, not something that you want to have in our own series uh, on a five-year follow-up 
out of uh, 78 patients, we saw 20 of them having or coming back to us with biliary reflux. Upper GI endoscopy done in all these patients and four were normal. 16 of them showed changes of reflux. And these are new changes of reflux which were not there uh, before the surgery. And you can see that there were marginal jejunal ulcers in six marginal GE junction ulcers and GERD uh, in four of them, reflux in four, erosion who presented with hematemesis in two and four were absolutely normal. So again, the management, we need uh, to have a good technique, a long gastric tube in terms of an OAGB, a very wide GJ, an anti-reflux stitch as has been advocated over the last couple of years. Uh, Long-term PPIs has to be uh, prescribed to the patient to avoid uh, these ulcerations and uh, leading to further problems. Uh, very close monitoring with upper GI endoscopy, preferably annually, has to be done uh, for all these patients. And uh, in intractable cases where these patients land up with the problems and are not able to tackle it with all the above, a reversal of OHGB is mandatory and we need to do that. In our own series, four cases out of 16, uh, were reversed uh, or uh, the OAGB was converted into an RYGB because of uh, severe intractable uh, biliary reflux. <clears throat> Patients coming with newfound GERD. This is a population especially seen uh, after a sleeve gastrectomy that you will uh, notice or find that uh, they are coming back uh, with a gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, Preoperatively, in our uh, practice, we always do an upper GI endoscopy so that we don't offer a sleeve to the wrong person. And that is very important and key. So anybody who is sitting in this audience is going to practice or start practicing bariatric surgery, never perform a surgery without doing the upper GI endoscopy because you may land yourself up in a soup more often than not. It is the patient who suffers, not you. So always remember that. Correct practices are very important. And pre-existing GERD, hiatus, hernia, sleeve is clearly contraindicated. Uh, Post-sleeve gastrectomy, if a patient develops newfound GERD, again, an endoscopy, uh, preferably uh, even a manometry or a 24-hour pH metry to determine uh, the GERD uh, which has been caused uh, because of the sleeve. And uh, if uh, conservative line of management uh, fails, then uh, like you've seen in this video, you convert the sleeve into a gastric bypass and you approximate the crura and uh, do a cruroplasty. That is basically what one wants to uh, do in terms of relief of symptoms for the patient. And uh, believe you me, uh, next day itself, once the patient is on oral, the patient will tell you how happy he is and uh, not getting uh, any reflux and not getting any of the symptoms that he was uh, getting earlier because of the uh, hiatus hernia which had been caused. So that is something that you want to see. That is something which you want your patient to experience with respect to uh, vanishing of his uh, symptoms. In a, this is an interesting uh, slide, uh, especially if you're doing a sleeve and you know you're not uh, uh, too sure if the patient is going to land up with some reflux. You can uh, do a cruroplasty using the ligament uh, ligamentum teres and do a cardiopexy with a sleeve, and uh, you just rotate it around like a uh, like a band across the G junction, and that helps it or helps keep the sleeve down in the abdomen and doesn't allow uh, it to migrate up. And again, cruroplasty is uh, mandatory in these cases. So this is something that uh, you can always keep in the back of your mind as a technique which you can use. <clears throat> then we come to internal herniation. Internal herniation uh, defects always have to be closed. Mesentric defect, the Peterson defect. This, these are correct surgical practices, good surgical practices. And uh, you always use a non-absorbable suture at the time of the primary surgery so that you don't land up uh, with a herniation, uh, which is going to come a few years later. More often than not, your patient will land up with some other surgeon. You're going to come back, come to weight regain. A few years down the line, a bariatric surgery operated patient is going to come back to you possibly uh, with re weight regain. Uh, a multidisciplinary approach is always prudent. Uh, you have a dietitian, you have a trainer, you may need a psychologist, and you also need a lot of family support. Uh, Dr. Khandelwal had mentioned that a good lifestyle is always going to take the patient a long way, not just the surgery. 
so again emphasize or re-emphasize uh, changing the lifestyle of the patient if it's unhealthy uh, look into pharmaceutical options but normally more often than not uh, they don't really work so well as of today at least and uh, when everything else has been tried and failed a surgical conversion to a stronger malabsorptive procedure can be considered and in case of a surgical conversion of an RYGB or an OAGB, a lengthening of the BP limb is again an option which has to be weighed against, of course, the risk of having a malnutrition and uh, micronutrient deficiencies. <clears throat> uh, lithogenicity because of uh, rapid weight loss uh, uh, causes obviously cholelithiasis. So patients with st stones and sludges who present for a bariatric procedure always should undergo prophylactic cholecystectomy in the same setting. Uh, in uh, if the sonography is normal, uh, postoperatively, obviously, the patient is going to be prescribed uh, 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 arsodeoxycholic acid uh, for uh, six months. A very late complication, which one can see, it can also be uh, a delayed uh, postoperative uh, complication. You can have a fistula. More often than not, uh, you if you have a gas gastropleural fistula, it's going to be not too far away from the day of surgery you perform the surgery because the patient probably had a sleeve leak and that has gone and uh, you know uh, connect, connected with the pleural cavity uh, gastrogastric and a gastrocolic more often than not will be a very very late uh, complication may come after uh, many months or even years after uh, a bariatric surgery uh, usually uh, uh, in a post sleeve patient uh, is like I already mentioned, the leaks are always at the upper end near the GE junction. And in an ROIGB or a ROAGB, the gastric pouch GJ uh, are the most potential sites. Very rarely will you have a leak in the JJ if you've not closed the enterotomy properly. Uh, that is uh, because of poor technique. And um, again, uh, because of uh, the abdominal obesity and the wall, wall thickness, Presentations can always be insidious, but your index of suspicion needs to remain really high. <clears throat> and uh, they are treated just like uh, any other enteric fistula or uh, in uh, pleurogastric fistulas, you need to probably go in and do a devortication also. <clears throat> uh, in conclusion, complications are a part of every medical and surgical field. A thorough knowledge, good technical skill, and a very, very high index of suspicion will help to prevent most complications. A uh, bariatric surgeon should be well aware of all the possible scenarios that may arise post-operatively. And when in doubt, always uh, call for help. And uh, somebody said, somebody means uh, Dr. Atul Gawande has said this, and I think it's very prudent and uh, fits the bill here. No matter what measures are taken, doctors will sometimes falter and it isn't reasonable to ask that we achieve perfection. What is reasonable is to ask that we never cease to aim for it. That's your take-home message for this evening. Thank you very much for a very patient hearing.